colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure and honor to uh, welcome you all to this uh, webinar. And um, let me start by showing you this. This is a book which we once produced 2012 with OUP, International Prosecutors. And some of the art lovers among you will recognize what the, the drawing actually is. It is from Francesco da Goya. And it says, the sleep of reason produces monsters. Well, in a certain way, that's also the topic of today's webinar, because it is about the whole question to what extent there are indeed unfettered discretionary powers or not for the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. Because as we know, in many respects, that prosecutor enjoys re really very broad um, powers with regard to the selection and the prioritization of situations and cases before the ICC. Such discretion shapes the court, but yet it has been often uh, criticized. While the current prosecutor, Fatou Ben Souda, is reaching the end of her mandate in June of this year, and the new prosecutor, Karim Khan, has just been elected, it is probably time to take stock. So the questions that we will be discussing here are how much discretion does the prosecutor really have? How has this discretion been exercised so far? What is the way forward, especially now that we are getting a new prosecutor? So this roundtable, I think, is really very timely. And it aims to discuss all these and other questions. And we hope also that you will join us with a couple of questions concerning those discretionary powers of the ICC prosecutor. I want to congratulate my colleague, Ms. Deletta Marchisi, who is a, um, a doctoral fellow at the Research Foundation Flanders, in bringing together a real stellar cast of academic experts and practitioners to discuss this very issue. I'm going to hand over the floor uh, to her right now, but let me tell you already something as a teasener. We are still around more or less the time of a late breakfast. So let me tell you something. We will be talking about donors, but you will see in what way. Thank you very much. Over to you, Diletta. Thank you very much to Professor Jan Wouter for his introduction and for hosting here us today. Um, I'm very excited to have this great roundtable of academic and practitioners here today with us to discuss the seminal and an urgent topic. It would be impossible to summarize their amazing CVs, but let me present them to you very quickly. In alphabetical order, we have uh, Roger Bartels, assistant professor in military law at the Netherlands Defense Academy, on especially from his position as a legal officer in chambers, trial divisions of the ICC. Andre Klip, professor of criminal law and procedure at Maastricht University. Marie O'Leary, Counsel for the Office of Public Counsel for Defense at the ICC. Marie-Hélène Brou, Associate Counsel in the Defense Team of Gaisona and Legal Consultant for the Defense Team of Ongwen at the ICC. Dr. Rod Rustin, Legal Advisor in the Office of the Prosecutor at the ICC. William Shebas, Professor of International Law at Middlesex University, of Human Rights Law at International Criminal Law at Leiden University, and Professor Emeritus at the National University of Ireland, Galway. Thank you so much to all of you for being here with us today. I'm also very excited to have so many people that are following me here via Zoom and on streaming on YouTube. I will now give the speaker some talking points to discuss on our topic, prosecutorial discretion at the International Criminal Court. And we will also collect a few questions from the audience. So feel free to leave yours in the Q&A section anytime during the round table. And for those of you following us on YouTube, you can write them in the chat. So let's start, first of all, talking about prosecutorial discretion and its limits in general. We're talking about prosecutorial discretion in international criminal justice. We often mention a metaphor by Ronald Dworkin. In his famous book, Taking Rights Seriously, Dworkin stated that discretion is the all in a donor, which does not exist except as an area left open by a surrounding belt of restriction. My first set of questions for our speakers today is the following. 
How would you assess the donut of prosecutorial discretion at the International Criminal Court regarding the different powers the prosecutor can exercise at the different stages of the proceedings? How was the donut conceived by the drafters of the Rome Statute and how the donut turned out to be? Is this a beautiful balanced donut that serves its purpose or not? Do you think that the hole is large enough, it's not too large, it has the right size? And again, quoting Dworkin, what about the surrounding belt of restriction? The floor is yours. And uh, I would like to start. I would like to start here with who has experience actually working in the ICC office of the prosecutor. So, uh, uh, Rod, what do you think? Well, thank you very much for the uh, invitation, and um, I'm very happy to be here. Um, I'm not here as obviously as an apologist for case selection, but I'm here to contribute to a discussion. So I, I, um, I have an academic background, but also I work at the Office of the Prosecutor and I've been here for, for a number of years. Um, I think just as an initial point, um, of course, uh, case selection um, arises from the inevitability that um, choices have to be made. Um, as you know, uh, this is perhaps the most uh, pressing uh, ethical dilemma that all prosecutors face is uh, how to make choices uh, where to um, uh, focus um, the, uh, the priorities for um, uh, judicial accountability before the ICC, um, knowing that uh, as a consequence of making those choices, um, other uh, worthy uh, focuses of the court's attention, if you like, um, will, uh, will, will, will not um, receive um, the same type of attention by the court. And then uh, having made those choices or in making those choices um, are, are the... Uh, the factors that are employed by the prosecutor's office to make those choices, are they sound? Are they reasonable? Um, is there some element of transparency? Uh, and are they based on criteria that one would, uh, would um, um, ag agree with um, in broad terms? That's fine. That, that's a, a sort of a, a theoretical discussion. And I think uh, we would all recognize that uh, choices have to be made. You can't have every single uh, uh, allegation investigating these situations. These are situations of mass atrocities where the, uh, the victims, um, 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 in terms of the incidents, the incidents could span uh, dozens, uh, hundreds, thousands of incidents where alleged crimes are occurring uh, in some of these armed conflicts or situations. Uh, in peacetime uh, where these crimes occur. The, uh, the number of perpetrators could be also in the hundreds or thousands, depending on different levels of responsibility. And the crime base of victimhood, it could run into tens of thousands, or if you're talking about cases involving displacement, possibly into the hundreds of thousands or even millions. So clearly no court could have universal capture of all these allegations. So choices have to be made. Um, so that's, that's just a general point. But of course, the issue is not so much uh, if we might agree on the choices. Uh, the issue is how is it applied in practice? And I think that's where the difficulty lies. And I think it will be interesting to hear the, also the thoughts of the panelists um, on this. Because of course, every choice is very divisive. Um, we operate in very polarized contexts where different communities um, have very different narratives and views of what happened. And the international community sometimes also has very polarized views uh, of uh, what is happening in a situation. These are some of the most uh, controversial, difficult crises uh, facing the international community often. Um, so of the practical application of case selection can also raise a lot of contested views. Um, on the most uh, simplistic sense, of course, uh, people who are critical of the decisions on choice selection might, might suggest that decisions have been taken on an unethical basis or an improper basis influenced by um, 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 some kind of ulterior motive. But I think that the problem as a practitioner is that even if you'd make a decision that you believe is sound, soundly grounded on what you believe are you know, ethical reasons, this is a worthy case that represents criminality, this is a, a worthy target of, of investigation and prosecution, this is emblematic of the type of criminality, even if that's a kind of, uh, if you like, it, it, um, your, your sense of what you are doing, 
nonetheless, of course, there is a flip side of, well, what about somebody else? What about that other incident? What about another perpetrator? Or isn't there somebody behind the person that you arrested who is really responsible? Or what about another situation? What about the conflict happening over there? Um, what about, uh, um, you know, is there also some kind of uh, regional bias or anti-African bias or colonial bias? or Western bias? What about uh, the business uh, side of it? What about the finances of the crimes? What about those who create the conditions? Or what about uh, the sense of what is justice? Uh, is criminal justice really what we mean by justice? Isn't it a very a narrow uh, and uh, unsatisfying perspective on these situations of deep malaise in these societies? How can criminal justice come to grips with what is fundamentally a broader problem with injustice uh, in these societies in this in the world in relation to uh, deep levels of disparities of wealth and poverty uh, economic imbalances um, corruption uh, democratic deficits and all kinds of rural law challenges so of course viewed in these perspectives all of these issues put into um, then the lens of the choice on case selection made by the ICC, it becomes almost an impossible burden. And I think you, there is a risk of weighing these courts with, with, with uh, improbable burdens, asking them to resolve or be a panacea to these deep malaises in society. And, and sometimes um, um, expecting too much from what is after all um, a criminal accountability process where decisions have to be made, choices have to be made and cases brought to trial. So I just think uh, maybe just as an introduction work of, um, that indeed uh, the donut has a hole. It's very difficult in practice to, to, to be able to identify in the abstract uh, how that hole should be framed. Um, this is the design feature of the Rome Statute that a prosecutor has been given this authority as opposed to the Security Council or states uh, directing where they want cases to be investigated. And then uh, the prosecutor also gets to choose the cases. So this is, this is indeed a, a very uh, challenging this a um, issue within the office of the prosecutor, but and even more so for the outside uh, commentators and stakeholders to try to uh, come to consensus on on where uh, case selection and prioritization should should be focused. Maybe that's all I'll say for now. But maybe I've spoken too much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rod. And um, Marie Helen, do you have the same view on this? What do you think? Uh, Rod said that there's a hole, huh? but you know. He kind of highlighted the problems of having this hole somehow. Thank you, uh, Dilata. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation to participate uh, in this round table. Uh, I should start, however, by uh, just a little disclaimer and say that what I'm saying here today is my personal opinion and does not reflect the opinions of the teams I'm working for or I've worked for in the past, um, just, just so that's clear. Um, I think it was a, it was very interesting uh, to hear Rod uh, give his views about this, and I would agree with him to an extent. I think that um, I have a lot of sympathy for the position that the office of the prosecutor is finding itself in. It's a very difficult uh, job to do. Case selection is, um, I'm sure, extremely challenging. And, uh, and of course, it, it can, as Rod said, it, it's, these choices are very criticized uh, on, on both sides often. Uh, this being said, I think that the prosecutor, unfortunately, is, is kind of held hostage to state cooperation. I think state cooperation is the biggest uh, challenge in, uh, in exercising that prosecutorial discretion. And what I mean by that is that the prosecutor um, naturally, I think, and I have no idea what's going on between those walls, but I would assume that the prosecutor's choices will be guided by what is possible. And what is possible depends largely, if not mostly, on, on states' willingness to cooperate with the investigations, to let investigators in, uh, and, and most importantly, to surrender suspects. Um, and I think this is why the choices often can seem like they are unbalanced or sometimes don't really make sense in terms of who the ICC is actually uh, bringing in before the court. But it's probably led by pragmatism and what can actually be achieved. And so uh, when going back to the donut, I don't think that there is one model for each case. I think that this whole 
um, goes, you know, gets bigger or smaller depending on, on each individual situation. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, it, and it raises, of course, questions of, of fairness, questions of, uh, of impartiality. I don't think that the office of the prosecutor is, has bad intentions or has nefarious motives. I just think that they are extremely limited by the practicalities um, in the ground. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marie I would like to hear now from uh, from the others. Um, do you have any comments to make on on this um, debate that we already have? Um, maybe Rohir or uh, William. Sure, I can uh, <clears throat> I can jump in. Um, yeah, well, first, uh, thanks for the invitation to participate, and also uh, I also have to just make the general disclaimer that it's neither uh, the view of the Minister of Defense, my current employer, or the ICC, my permanent employer, uh, what I'm saying today. Um, so if, and I think it was highlighted very well already by Rod and uh, Marie-Hélène, that there, there has to be the um, a sense of pragmatism to the choices to be made. And in that sense, um, as Marie Lane already indicated, it's state cooperation. It's not just state cooperation. It's all like if you if we stay within the, the metaphor of the donut, what the ICC office of the prosecutor can add to that is perhaps maybe just the glazing or the sprinkling if uh, on a donut. Because the actual dough, the shape that's been shaped by the state parties, uh, when they negotiated the Rome Statute, uh, the ASP, when they uh, negotiate the, um, the, the budget, um, because of course the ability by the OTP, and it stresses that every year when it asks for a budget, it says, we can only do this much with the budget that you give us. And we have to be realistic in this sense. There's a lot of states that purposely want to limit the budget for that reason to make sure that the OTP can do a certain amount of things, but not too much. Um, and within that uh, uh, framework, choices have to be made. Uh, and again, if we stay with this metaphor, in that sense, it might be, uh, and I'm not a big fan of donuts, but I'm quite partial to um, Timbits, the Canadian uh, thing that uh, like Marie-Hélène and Bill will understand maybe what I'm referring to. In, uh, a big uh, coffee uh, company in, in Canada. Uh, my wife is Canadian, she introduced me to it, produces what they call the whole of the donut, like little bowls that should fit kind of in the whole of the donut. And it's almost maybe more if the, the, the freedom of the prosecution, the real discretion is that, that like a timbit rather than the donut itself. Um, having said that, I do think that um, some of the decisions made do raise questions and even if those questions may be understandable the otp may need to do and over years have started to do that but initially certainly didn't need to do a better job in explaining um, these questions this is difficult because there's investigations going on you don't want to disclose who you're otherwise also investigating there may be under seal arrest warrants that you can't disclose but um, just on the face of it certain decisions will uh, raise questions and even and not just situations but if you go then within a situation the selection of the accused if you um, if you look at the ranking within an armed force or with, then why this person but not the person who's actually superior to him or her um, and, and in the end obviously and we have to also be realistic in that sense it's a question of opportunity um, so the pragmatism like can you actually go after that person um, and yeah, that has to be taken into account. But within that then, and this relates more to the, the, um, the, the roles of international criminal justice and is it just punitive retribution? Do you wanna take the person out of the equation for prevention of future instances is then the selection of the crimes and uh, related to that, uh, or the selection of the incidents, I think plays a important role. And there especially, I think, more can be done in terms of explaining. If you look at, for example, one of the recent cases yesterday, it was the, um, the, the reparation uh, order in Nataganda, but that case um, 
related to 2002-2003 incidents. Whilst the world knew Natiganda for being the commander of M23, that's how the world knew him. He was famous for that. And um, none of that was part of, um, of the, the charges um, against Mr. Natiganda. So a very large component of his well, uh, victims, uh, alleged victims of alleged crimes that he may have um, also been guilty of uh, in relation to M23 were entirely left out of the equation. And, and this kind of um, selection or the selection to focus on particular villages, not on other villages or particular incidents in Katanga and Kujulo, the, to focus on one specific attack on the village of Bogoro, whilst there were, and the evidence brought this out very clearly, a, a, a series of attacks on that same village, which meant that other persons maybe fall outside the um, the scope. Um, having said then that better explaining may need to be done, I think the last um, statement by the uh, uh, by the prosecutor, by Ms. Bansuda in relation to the opening of the investigation into the Palestine situation showed that it, it is possible to make a very balanced, very clear explanation why certain things do expectation management and I think in that sense that that statement is a good example of the the need to to yeah to to explain the the discretion thank you and the ability much. to do it really sorry to interrupt thank, thank you very much Rahir thank you so it's it's clear from here that pragmatism it's it's really like an important yes William well, yes, I wanted to jump in, especially oh, sure. because, because I'm probably one of the experts here on the subject of donuts. I know a lot about donuts. I grew up in the land of donuts. Um, one of my first girlfriends worked in a donut shop. Uh, and so you may not, not all know that, that not all donuts have holes in them. Um, there are a lot of donuts that don't have holes in them. They have, uh, they're filled with jam or custard. And so when we talk about donuts, we can't assume they have holes. Uh, it's like tribunals. So if we look at certain international criminal tribunals, basically all the predecessors of the ICC, the, the big hole they have, as far as the prosecutor is concerned, is that the prosecutor may get to select the cases, but doesn't get to select the situations. That's done for them by somebody else, by a political body. And the, the, the great, to me, the, 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 when we talk about the discretion by the prosecutor in the selection, I don't find the cases as interesting as the situations part of it. I think that's the more interesting part and that's the unique part. That's the jam. So the prosecutor has a hole, a donut without a hole that's filled with delicious jam. And the jam is that she gets to pick the, the situations. Now, of course, that was controversial a controversial matter when the court was being set up and some countries like the United States have still never accepted that power and that authority of the prosecutor. But um, th that was the decision that was made, but I don't think we knew when the Rome Statute was adopted exactly how that would work. But in the last few years, we've had two situations that have been litigated at the court that have, I think, clarified that. The first one is the the, the Gaza flotilla case, the Mavi Marmara situation. And the second is the Afghanistan situation. Mavi Marmara was about whether the judges could tell the prosecutor to prosecute somewhere where she didn't want to prosecute. And of course, Afghanistan was about the judges being able to tell the prosecutor that she can't prosecute somewhere where she wants to prosecute. And as far as I can see, the prosecutor won on both of those. So the, the prosecutors discretion in the selection of situations has been greatly strengthened and reaffirmed in the last few years. Uh, and I think that's a very uh, positive development personally. Um, although there are, I think there is, so, there is a flaw in the design of the ICC that is still not, you know, that we just have to deal with. I, I, and that, that is the fact that we leave this huge power for the selection of situations in the hands of one individual. And so Roger has referred to this decision of last week by the prosecutor to open the investigation into Palestine. Um, that decision is valid for the next three or four months until the new prosecutor comes. The new prosecutor may have a different view on it. 
you know, thinking about that decision, I also, um, uh, I believe it's useful to consider whether the prosecutor could have gone the other way. I don't think it would have been entirely unreasonable for a prosecutor to look at that decision of the uh, pretrial chamber on Palestine that was issued in early February and say, you know, two to one isn't good enough for me. I asked for a heads up. I asked for some guidance because I have to make these big investigations. And I know that I need that guidance because the next time I may be going before three different judges or I'll be going before a single judge for an arrest warrant who may agree with the dissenting judge and will refuse to issue the arrest warrant. So I think that that that, that took, that was a, an exercise of her discretion uh, on that issue. Aside from her own decision that she wants to go ahead with Palestine, she could still have said, I don't think that, that they, we don't have unanimity in the pretrial chamber and that's too uncertain, too unstable for me. I, I'll just finish with that. I have one other thought. We know from the submissions that were made in, that, in the Palestine uh, decision by certain governments and other statements that governments have made, I'm thinking about the government of the country of Donuts, Canada, they don't like Palestine being at the ICC. They don't think it's a state party. They made that clear. But, and there are other countries who have been big supporters of the court who told the prosecutor not to proceed, but she's decided to do it. It showed great courage on her part and, and we should be full of admiration for. Her. And those countries now have to support her decision because they wanted an independent prosecutor. They insisted on it at the Rome conference and they got it. So they have to live with it. And, and I don't think, I think it would be a terrible thing if those countries were now to start sniping at the prosecutor for her exercise, her taking of what is an extremely difficult situation. They should say, look, we, we may not have been in favor of the decision, but we support her, her determination to do it 100%. Thank you very much. So here again, we have the topic of how much choices can be divisive and controversial, but the point that independent, it, it, it's what um, makes a discretion uh, uh, possible and what makes the independency of the, of the prosecutor possible, for sure. We still have to hear uh, um, from Marie, yes. Yeah, you're, you're thank you very much. <laughs> thank you for inviting me um, to this fascinating roundtable and discussion of donuts. Um, and again, my views are my own as well. Um, and when thinking about this donut metaphor, you know, there's the hole in the donut that's prosecutorial discretion that we're all talking about. The restrictions you're talking about is the dough. Um, but neither the dough or the, the empty space in the middle have ever interested me in donuts. It's the sprinkles, it's the glaze, it's all of the added, addings on top that make it so tempting to eat, actually. Um, and what are those? I was trying to think about what are those restrictions, the sprinkles on top of it that I think Rajya even mentioned. Um, honestly, those have to come into play with the prosecutor's own restrictions. The part that Rod had actually spoken about. Uh, as far as the restrictions they have to place on themselves and whether it comes up in the form of uh, ability or budget concerns that I think were also got mentioned here as well. Um, there are certain restrictions they placed on themselves and, and quite a few that I find quite fascinating. Um, as far as the regulations of the prosecutor themselves are one body uh, where they've committed themselves to certain restrictions. They are quite broad, I will say, in my opinion but they are a set of restrictions that have been then somewhat complemented uh, over time by policy papers and reports on case selection and prioritization, um, on policies of promoting, uh, looking at certain types of crimes in particular that are being committed across the globe. So I think that this body of texts is really that part of the glaze and the restriction that gets put on top of the already existing donut restrictions of you know, the Rome statute or the rules of procedure and evidence themselves um, to look at it. And so in that, you know, it's, it's an artistry to actually design the donut. And so I think it's very interesting that um, the, the choice of the prosecution is made along the way. Um, and I think that potentially uh, that body of work is something that can be looked at more closely to allow the prosecutor to not just explain better, but to devise better how 
um, they are going to go about making their own restrictions. Um, but that said, I, of course, from a defense perspective, am looking more <clears throat> less at the situation level, quite frankly, um, and more at the actual case by case level um, and the choices that the prosecution can make in those restrictions to make a very palatable donut one that sits well. Um, there are many, many parts of prosecutorial discretion that I was thinking about in, in preparing for this that I think get overlooked. Uh, the choice, for example, of an arrest warrant or a summons is a choice that the prosecutor makes based on the evidence in front of them, but it has long ranging implications for a defendant in the case. In particular, the, the law of the ICC being one of changed circumstances in order to receive interim release means that a choice to have an arrest warrant at the beginning sets the tone already for uh, potential detention rather than potentially issuing a summons. And this has come up in some cases, in particular, those Article 70 cases, um, the choices that have to be made by the prosecutor, of course, with approval by, um, by a bench, in particular for an arrest warrant. Uh, but every choice that's made, you know, and I think Rod had spoken about um, in particular, the choice of how many charges and the impact, you know, uh, what can you do, what's possible. And I think Rogier had even mentioned further um, about the impact of that, which we saw yesterday, for example, the choice of the number of situation or the choice of the number of incidents that get put into a case definitely impacts the number of victims then who have the ability to, to seek uh, recompense from the court um, and has an impact much later down the road in a reparations decision. Um, and you have any number of duration of the trial, um, the number of accused impacts a the way a defense team can work. There are so many choices that the prosecutor makes um, that I'm actually interested in hearing more about uh, that impact how uh, a defense team actually works and how a defendant actually sees a case uh, realized through to the very end. Thank you very, thank you very much, Marie. Thank you. Andre, do you have any comments on this? Uh, yes, I have. Uh, I can disclose that I'm not an expert on donuts. Uh, uh, that's far too sweet for me. Uh, and and, and to, to, yeah, using metaphors is always very intriguing and, uh, uh, and, and tempting. Uh, uh, maybe discretion of the prosecution is, is more like a piece of wet soap. The moment you hold it in your hand, it slips away and, and uh, uh, you have to start uh, uh, looking at it. Or maybe it is uh, the, the, the task for the prosecution is like, like skating on, on, on ice. Uh, I have more experience in that. Uh, uh, so, uh, um, but I think that, that the important thing uh, more to the contents is that, that uh, uh, whatever the prosecution will decide, uh, it will be open for criticism. Uh, uh, whatever decision you, you, you make, uh, uh, you can expect uh, uh, criticism. And that belongs to, uh, uh, to prosecuting international crimes, highly politicized uh, environment. Uh, uh, so that as such, I think is not a indicator that uh, uh, things go wrong. Um, I think that the, the, there are a couple of restrictions, uh, uh, some of which are mentioned uh, already to the discretion of the prosecutor. Uh, that is that it does uh, 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 decide on cases, but not on situations. Uh, and that is a, a, a serious uh, 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 restriction. Um, what I miss in the, the uh, selection of cases is uh, the incorporation of the complementarity principle as a way to give guidance to states. Um, I think that the, the current uh, uh, position of the OTP and the court is that it takes cases, it pros prosecutes cases, it adjudicates cases, uh, but it has very little uh, uh, view on giving guidance to, to states. Um, I think currently there is not enough enthusiasm with states to prosecute international crimes, and we even see the, the effects that some states refer to the court in order to get rid of uh, 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 political opponents or to get rid of uh, uh, politically difficult uh, uh, cases. Uh, and I think the court should do more to, uh, to, give a, to, to make, give a, a, a representative selection. Uh, some of uh, uh, the previous speakers did uh, uh, allude to that, uh, uh, that there is representation 
in the number of instances or the type of instances, type of victims, and all of that is, is good. Uh, but if you look at the, 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 uh, the practice of the tribunal, this tribunal, but also the ad hoc tribunals, uh, there is a clear preference for prosecuting the most responsible uh, uh, for international crimes. That as such is understandable and good, but it means that there are other roles uh, uh, for less responsible individuals that um, have other legal issues to, to be debated. Uh, and that is very, very important for the majority of willing states that want to, uh, are willing to investigate and prosecute uh, lower ranking individuals. They are without guidance from the International Criminal Court. And I think that is, uh, that, that, that is a, 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 um, a point that is, that is lacking. Uh, it is, it is uh, uh, very sad that, that when it comes to, uh, to, def to defenses, uh, we have little more than the Ademovich case of the ICTY. Uh, and that may be highly relevant for, uh, for states uh, that are willing to prosecute. So I would uh, I'd like to see more impact of uh, more influence of the complementarity principle. Uh, but with saying that, I'm also, of, of course, also one of the people in, in, in indirectly criticizing the, 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 the prosecution for the choices uh, uh, that it makes. And it is definitely very difficult. Uh, and in that sense, I think the prosecutor should take uh, her or his uh, uh, own view uh, uh, and uh, follow that, uh, that line. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andre. Thank you. Uh, we have we have stressed already the importance of, of selection, of course, uh, as well as the the peril of, of bias or perception of bias, as well as transparency. This brings us to our second talking point, um, and I would like to start from a quotation again. The defense attorney of Lanzo, one of the accused in the Chalebici case at the ICTY stated that the criteria for selecting person for prosecution are based not on considerations of apparent criminal responsibility alone, but on extraneous policy reasons, such as ethnicity, gender, or administrative convenience. The ICC has similarly been the target of harsh critiques of political bias, and not only political bias. Not every legal discretionary decision is considered legitimate by all different stakeholders, and it's famous, for example, the African case that we already mentioned. More recently, the prosecutor decision not to open an investigation into the Iraq and UK situation attracted also this type of criticism. And this situation has, of course, a detrimental impact on the perception stakeholders have of the court and ultimately its legitimacy. So my questions here are, how to deal with this issue is more transparency on how the ICC prosecutor takes decision needed, are more supervision or accountability mechanism over prosecutorial discretion necessary? I'll give you the floor to discuss this point. Shall we start now from um, uh, Rod, you were saying something? No, no, I was just, I just was wondering if you want me to take a full breath. I'm happy to defer to others. I, I don't mind, I, uh, as you wish. Do you want me to start or I can, I can wait? If, if you want to start, you're very welcome. No, Otherwise, no, I mean, it's just, uh, sorry, I, 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 I didn't mean yeah. to presume. Um, um, <laughs> no, I mean, I, I don't have uh, uh, any uh, secret guidance, obviously. Uh, I'm, I'm in the same position as all of us, so trying to make sense of, of this dilemma, I think the point in the, in the last round is that obviously discretion is something that's inevitable in this in this work. Uh, it's not that discretion is per se a dirty word or that it's wrong. It, it is in the nature of the job, whether we like it or not. And I think even if uh, good decisions are made, there's always a flip side to a good decision that people disagree with it. Um, I think the problem is obviously if you feel that a, a, a prosecutor's office has become unruly and is taking clearly uh, malicious, frivolous decisions. But I think that that's uh, um, more um, unlikely um, um, outcome, but, but of course uh, it, it may happen. <clears throat> I think on the issue of um, perceptions indeed and politicization, I think again this is uh, inevitable uh, to some extent given that the ICC operates and all these courts and tribunals operate in very polarized settings. And indeed the ICTY was criticized for bringing token cases, trying to 
have some kind of equivalence of blame, even though the, the you know the majority of the cases uh, were uh, uh, targeting um, uh, the numbers largest number were uh, against. Uh, Serb or Bosnian Serb perpetrators, but there were also cases against all, all different sides, and some of them were seen as tokenistic. By contrast, of course, the ICTR was criticized for not uh, doing cases involving the RPF, but uh, although there were some cases that transferred to the national level. So I think the ICC obviously faces the same dilemma, but in some ways it's even more concentrated. I think the difference with the tribunals is, is basically uh, a, um, a, a temporal or pragmatic one. They had 20, 25 years with a single situation in which they could uh, have a lot more depth in the situation. And therefore the choices on, on discretion could be dispersed, if you like, um, across multiple uh, incidents, multiple individuals. So there was more of an opportunity to try to show uh, um, some element of um, coverage uh, in which discretion would still be there, but it was, in some ways, it was, it was more diluted and diffused. Now, of course, uh, the majority of the cases, as Andrea also mentioned, of course, uh, are being dealt with at national level. Um, uh, the state court in, in Sarajevo has been de dealing with over 2,000 su suspects uh, plus, uh, trying to prioritize. There are cantonal courts, there are cases happening at, at, to some extent in, in Croatia and Serbia as well, and, and, and in Kosovo. There have been eff efforts. So th the ICC, the fact that each situation will typically not have 20 years life cycle with, with hundreds of suspects. You may only have uh, one person uh, in the case of Bemba, for example, or, or a handful of persons um, um, focused, uh, five persons, for example, in relation to the LRA um, uh, related case. In, in some situations, only one side uh, may end up being uh, uh, investigated or prosecuted, which can be criticized indeed, but it may also be in relation to uh, where the uh, evidence and opportunity be better lies. In some cases, you have both sides investigated and prosecuted, but still a very small handful of individuals. So all of these issues relating to um, possible bias or politicization becomes even much more concentrated in the context of the ICC. And I think this is one of the sort of design flaws. I think um, Bill is also mentioning uh, about uh, design flaws. I think one of them is, is that this court is set up with this um, unrealistic mandate, if you like. Uh, it, um, it, it's set up as if it's a single situation tribunal, but in fact, it's, it's been designed to handle multiple situations. And to some extent, the issue of case selection almost breaks down before these courts, before the ICC, because of the sheer capacity to bring cases. Right now, you have a, a, a situation where the court, um, it doesn't have a terribly, um, um, it's, it's not a terrible budget. The, the office of the prosecutor um, um, has about uh, uh, 45 million euros budget. The court has about 150 million euros. Uh, it's comparable to some extent at some points where the uh, tribunals were, uh, but it's handling um, already cases that are beyond its capacity. It has about eight cases currently before it at different levels, pre-trial, trial, appeal. And the court is basically at breaking point. It can't handle more than uh, uh, around eight cases currently, and it's struggling to roll out uh, the new investigations. And in fact, the prosecutor has to resort in her public messaging to, to try to lower expectations, say, we also face a situation where we have multiple investigations to open, but we're beyond breaking point. And I appeal again for funds and resources. Uh, this is basically, I think the last statements on Nigeria and Ukraine in particular, she made the point that um, the mismatch between demand and, and, and resources is just, uh, 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 just unsustainable. So in those situations, it, it even goes beyond case selection because there are no cases to select at some, in some ways because the investigation can't even be rolled out. So this is a, a, a bigger problem, if you like, in relation to what is the correct capacity and model for the ICC. Uh, the independent expert review, it, uh, to some extent, answers it. They say, well, the ICC should focus on um, the most grave situations. Uh, and and um, hibernate those investigations that are not particularly grave or less grave. But of course, each of those situations that we're discussing are extremely grave. If you look at Nigeria, uh, where 20 to 30,000 uh, people, uh, civilians have been killed in the context of uh, the, uh, the armed conflict between Boko Haram and the Nigerian security forces alone, never mind other incidents happening in Nigeria, it's one of the uh, most extreme situations uh, anywhere in the world. Same for Afghanistan. Um, even uh, you look at what's happening in Eastern Ukraine is hardly um, a minor situation. 
So it's very difficult to also prioritize based on gravity. So I think this issue obviously um, also deserves some some deep scrutiny. I think the fundamental flaw, if you like, in, in the design is is the is the mismatch between the capacity of the court and and what it's been asked to achieve. And maybe part of the answer, and maybe I'll end here, is what Andrew says is about uh, uh, states indeed assuming their burdens. I mean, the ICC was always designed not as a substitute. Uh, I think states, when they drafted the court, indeed understood quite clearly that the, uh, 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 a, um, a, a mega ICTY or a mega ICTR covering the whole globe would be sure, uh, surely unsustainable uh, and beyond the capacities of the international community so that states would bear the primary burden and then the ICC would do those exceptional cases where states were unwilling, unable. Perhaps that was uh, overly optimistic. But uh, the results that we've seen is that we haven't seen a terrible increase in domestic act activism since the ICC has, has been adopted. We do see, of course, some cases, it's, uh, it's much to be applauded, universal jurisdiction, some activation of, of national cases, uh, some uh, increased use of court martials, but not a, a seismic shift in the landscape of, uh, of enforcement of IHL or domestic norms. Uh, so the court still often in these situations remains the primary um, stakeholder uh, uh, or primary institution. Um, there are other situations where national authorities have stepped up and have said that they want to do these cases, but they simply are, uh, don't have the capacity or, or, or they don't have the means to, to do it, or they don't have control over the territory and so on. So I think there is still this, this, this sort of structural issue that, that confronts the international community. Uh, is the ICC there to substitute uh, uh, failures at the national level, in which case it needs to be a, a completely different dimension of, of capacity and institution and, and, and the powers given to it? Or is it more um, an occasional court doing uh, exceptional cases here and there and the primary burden rests at the national level? But in that case, where are the, where is the, the, uh, the dynamism at the national level that's been fundamentally uh, uh, catalyzed, if you like, by the creation of the ICC. I think um, on that level too, there is still uh, much, much work to be done. Thank you very much, Rod. Thank you. Um, I see that William raised his hand before. Do you want to jump in now? Well, yes, uh, Diletta, in your question, you uh, talked about new mechanisms. Do we need new mechanisms or some in the suggestion that there might be some, we, we might contemplate some change I mean, I think that's not really very realistic to talk about that happening, but even if it's just interesting intellectually to speculate on what they might be, uh, I'd be curious to see how we would how we would address this problem. It's when Rod talks about the budget of the court, we could say, well, we know how to fix that, raise the budget from 150, uh, 150 million to 500 million, and then they could do more cases. That too is unrealistic, but it's a, it's a, it's a way of solving that issue. To some extent, I think the point that Rod has just made, or uh, the points he's made, are so uh, relevant to this discussion because they actually um, uh, emphasize the importance, the growing importance of prosecutorial discretion, because the prosecutor has to decide between some very worthy situations and cases, uh, and is unable to to do them all. And that wasn't always the case back in the early days of the court. They were you know, they were almost hungry for a warm body with a pulse that they could get to The Hague and prosecute. And uh, there are cases that probably today they would look at and say, we don't need these. I mean, one of the things, all of the emphasis over the years on prosecuting rebel groups or insurgent groups, we can see how much of that can actually, complementarity can solve a lot of that problem. We, we just have been through the Ongwin trial or at least partway through the Ongwin trial Uganda has been willing and able to prosecute Ongwen for 10 or 15 years if they could get custody. And, and so that, that probably, in hindsight, maybe was, was unnecessary. We have two complex situations now confronting the prosecutor where, first of all, we're not dealing with a rebel group situation. So the complementarity doesn't work so well. You're going to governments and saying, prosecute your own people. And that is a, is, a, is, a, is a different kind of a challenge when you're dealing with complementarity. And we have more than one government involved. So I'm thinking, first of all, about Israel-Palestine, obviously, where a choices would have to be made. We know that the prosecutor in her preliminary examination reports has said she's looking at both sides, which is proper and right, and she should be doing that. But at some point, decisions will have to be made about, about which ones to do. 
And it, it will be a bit like the Yugoslavia tribunal, the example you gave, or the Rwanda tribunal. And then we have the other one that's even got two labels, Venezuela one and Venezuela two. They're all part of basically one big, one big situation and one big crisis, but they involve different factors. They involve, as in the Palestine situation, a non-party state, Venezuela too, and they involve accusations against the government, in the case of the government of Venezuela, just like the government of the state of Palestine. And so there, hard decisions will, will, will have to be made by a prosecutor. I don't see any mechanism that can change that or any amendment uh, that will change that. It will be about the credibility, uh, the integrity of the prosecutor, the credibility of the prosecutor. And, um, and uh, uh, we have to be supportive of that, as I said before, um, because you can't ask someone to do that job if they're going to be if they're going to be attacked and criticized and undermined every time they exercise the, the discretion. Thank you very much. That's indeed a very interesting, uh, a re very interesting point you're making. I'm curious to know if the defense representatives we have here um, are the same view. Marie or Marie Hélène, do you want to jump in? I can go ahead. So the question um, of, of who ends up in front of the court is one that as a defense counsel, you have to you have to face almost on a daily basis because of all the clients I've had in, in my career in defense, the question why me uh, comes back again and again. And, and there's this, um, it's an impossible question to answer. Uh, frankly, as a defense, as a, as a defense counsel, and it's a very, um, it's it's on a human level. You know, you're faced with someone who has had, frankly, bad luck. I mean, not that I'm not saying that none of these accusations are justified and that none of them should be there, but most of them are rebels. They were fighting in some in some capacity against the government. No government official has been, you know, surrendered. In, from the LRA, U, Uganda, the, the Mali, Malian world rebels, uh, the, the, the Central African Republic are rebels. The DRC detainees uh, accused were rebels as well. Um, and so it, it becomes some sort of a victor's justice uh, on, on, a, on some level, because mm -hmm. the government who is cooperating with the court is sending, um, is sending in individuals who you know, were against it um, and and it's, a, it's a weird balance because these people were important enough in the conflict that the OTP can actually build a case against them, but were not so important as to, you know, as, so that their surrender might destabilize maybe a peace process or the political balance that there is, you know, uh, locally. And so, um, you know, I've been in cases before where, for example, uh, I, I have a client and the common plan alleged by the prosecutor mentions a number of individuals, most of whom are walking freely around you know, the country, giving interviews to media, uh, sometimes being member of, members of government themselves because they, you know, the situation politically there made it such that they rehabilitate themselves or they have a role to, to play in the peace process. And so it's inconvenient for the government to surrender these people. But then you have your client who says, well, I'm alleged to have committed these crimes with this person who is walking freely and is not in any, in any way or sense in danger from, from these proceedings. And so the feeling of unfairness is real. And, and you, you, know, you can't deny that there is, there is a, a problem potentially there uh, because it gives the, the you know, strong impression that these are political, um, political trials. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of an issue um, and, and it's difficult to, to make sense of it when you're facing, um, when you're facing these, um, these situations. And I wanted to rebound on what um, previous uh, speakers have said about uh, domestic proceedings. Um, it's not work, I mean, it's not working very well, even, even when there's a possibility, for example, um, the, just last year, the Yekatom defense team requested that Mr. Yekatom be transferred back to the Central African Republic, who has a special criminal court specifically for these, uh, for these uh, type of, of situations. And uh, neither the prosecutor 
uh, nor the Central African Republic were very interested at all in receiving Mr. Yekatom in front of their, in trying Mr. Yekatom in front of their domestic court. And so you wonder, why is that? And I think, well, as soon as the court gets a, a case, it hangs on to it because it, you know, it wants to, to play a role in, in, in the case that it's been given an opportunity to, to try. And similarly, you can expect that maybe it was, in this case, politically inconvenient for the Central African Republic to, um, to, to try and, and, and prosecute Mr. Yekatom themselves. And so you can't deny the political um, influence over these trials. They're real. It doesn't mean that the trial of the ICC is necessarily going to be unfair, but it definitely casts a, a shadow of a doubt on, on the whole process, uh, frankly. And again, as a defense counsel, you have to face this with your client day in, day out. And, and these are very difficult um, explanations to give or, or conversations to have. Thank you very much, Marie-Hélène. I see the end of Marie is raised, so please go ahead. I figured while we're on the Marie's, but also just to dovetail on the defense um, point of view on this I, and agreeing with a lot of what Marie Lem has just raised. I think that it's that mystery about the choice of who is trying, which in particular with when we're looking at the car special court, um, who is being tried there, who is being tried at the ICC and what sort of discussions or interplay has happened uh, maybe between the offices of the prosecutor of each. Um, this is something that, for obvious reasons, probably can't be discussed publicly, but it does create that, um, that lack of information that does have people raising questions sometimes that are difficult for the court itself to answer. Um, another one, and to dovetail on Maria Lynn's point here about um, what a defendant thinks, or maybe even potentially others in the region or even victims may think is, you know, what is the choice of the prosecutor to make somebody an insider witness instead of actually charging them, but actually adopting them and using them in the process um, to gain evidence. Again, these are very difficult things to make transparent or to, to, to explain the choices, um, but they are ones that are very real to the prosecution's work to try to figure out um, how they can explain these choices without giving up um, information that obviously should be kept um, as a part of the investigation and the choices there. And as far as um, supervisory uh, mechanisms, you know, you, you had mentioned in your question, um, I think that the prosecution has a duty to self-regulate on a lot of this. Um, it's up to them. You don't want to be taking away prosecutorial discretion because you're going to lose um, their independence. You're going to lose a lot of the function of the, and the power of the prosecutor. That's not what we want is to have put in a bunch of regulatory bodies. But what I think, especially from a defense perspective, would be that we really would expect them to self-regulate and really test cases and look at the choices they make and the impact that they have, um, including the ability for what they are and are not able to explain, just given the ongoing investigations. Thank you very much, Marie. Uh, Andre or Rohir, do you want to jump in? Yeah, Rohir, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, okay. yes, I think both of your hands <laughs> were raised. <laughs> uh, yes, I, I, I fully, fully understand what, uh, what Marie Hélène and uh, Marie say. Um, I think the, 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 the issue here is that, that the crimes are by definition crimes with a political dimension. Uh, uh, the, 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 the offenders or the, the, the suspected offenders uh, allegedly uh, uh, used uh, uh, um, severe violence in order to, to reach uh, certain political goals. Uh, having said that, it, it may also explain that, that uh, um, from the defense point of view, the choice to prosecute them and not uh, uh, members of the opposing party uh, uh, may uh, uh, find its origin in a political choice. Um, that may be felt uh, uh, by, the, by the defense in, in, in that way, and it may create a, a feeling of unfairness. I fully understand that. Um, that not, does not necessarily need to be so. Um, I think that the, 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 the explanations are, are given already uh, uh, on, on that. Uh, uh, there is far more um, international crime and there are far more uh, uh, potential perpetrators than the OTP or the ICC can, can actually handle. Um, I don't, don't think there's anything wrong in the defense claiming uh, that the choice of their client 
uh, or there, this specific in incident is a uh, um, is, was was based on a, a political choice. Uh, but it is a question whether that is in the end uh, right, or maybe even it is a question whether uh, it was is the best way to defend. Uh, because it, if you claim the choice was made on political uh, uh, motives, uh, uh, you may indirectly already acknowledge the the uh, the, the incident. Uh, uh, in the end, I think it is inevitable that uh, uh, that uh, there, there is a, a, a potential uh, a claim for political choices because of the nature of the crime. So in that sense, I'm not that much worried. Uh, and I do think that the prosecutor has the discretion to make choices. Uh, and the very fact that, that uh, uh, the accused come from a specific background, uh, predominantly from a specific background, that as such is not uh, yet the evidence that, uh, uh, that the choices were made on, on a biased or political uh, uh, motivation. Thank you very much, Andre. So right here, please. Yeah. Um, well, when it comes to the the transparency issue, what you what you raised, uh, I think there's um, two components to it. To one extent, it's uh, like the one thing that everyone on Twitter or on social media will always say, like, "Oh, why don't you investigate Syria?" Which Obviously, it's very easy to answer. We don't have jurisdiction over Syria as the ICC, um, but it will still be raised. This will still be the thing that people will say. So, to a certain extent, people just who are men, not necessarily um, uh, experts in the field, but they that's the the one thing that will be the first response, um, and that can be easily addressed. But it requires um, a legal explanation, and that's maybe the same difficulty that what you see on the national level, it's very easy for populist political parties to make a certain point because the more reasonable explanation is a lot harder to get across. You need more words for that. You need more um, explanation. Um, then there's another component to it where I think the prosecution just can't give transparency, can't give explanations, even though people may sense what the reason will be. And that's perhaps what Andre said, the political component and the same with um, the, the choice for insider witnesses that, that of course, and that's not just at the IC, ICC, even at the ICY, which had, which was able to say, we want to go after Milosevic, the president of a country. Still, the question came up, like everyone was always wondering, like uh, I think General Vasilyevich, uh, a firearm general, who was like uh, the, the star insider witness in most of the cases. And everyone was like, why is he not actually an accused? Um, that these, these decisions will be made and maybe even so, even at a place like the ISDY, there are questions um, raised about that. But not only um, in a, at the ICC, you have generally the, the insider witnesses will be, there will be protective measures. So it's already hard to, uh, you can't even explain publicly um, who these persons are. So how, how do you explain it like um, uh, that this person may be uh, chosen to be a, a witness rather than an accused, even though that person could easily, of course, be an accused. Um, uh, but then, there are all the things that just can't be said. Uh, if the rebel groups, because it was an issue, of course, it was rebel groups coming before the or members of rebel groups coming before the court. But if the prosecutor had been investigating the other side, she obviously couldn't say that once there was a case going against um, against an opposition group member because the country would shut down for the prosecution and no. And the case could never, um, like any case, uh, saying like, yes, we also are investigating um, uh, the, the government, uh, Museveni, for example, in Uganda, would mean that you can't have any case against an RA member. You don't get cooperation. You can't have a, um, a country office. And obviously, the same would be in the DRC, saying like, well, we are also equally investigating the government is, would immediately um, create problems for the ongoing cases. And, and where the prosecutor did actually try to say like, no, we are equally investigating both sides in Cote d'Ivoire, that also, that led to a reaction. And um, so 
there's a lot of things that just can't be said because the court is as such just not powerful enough. It's not like the domestic situation where um, the, there's the all powerful office of the, uh, the prosecution and the, 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 the government has the, uh, the control and the ability to be more transparent perhaps and to be more transparent, <coughs> sorry, about the political choices because also on the domestic level, political choices are made in terms of discretion. Um, so yeah, I think uh, a lot of it, it's understanding, uh, understandable that the prosecution can't be um, uh, fully transparent about it. Um, doesn't mean that maybe at a later stage, there should be some transparency um, to, to give some explanation later because whether or not that's a key function to some extent, what the tri what tribunals do, what the court does is a form of history writing, of course, and explaining a conflict. So perhaps there should be an explanation at a later stage. We would have wanted to go after this person, this side, um, but we just weren't able to, um, yeah, to, to explain that, yeah, there maybe would have been more uh, balanced in an ideal situation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rod here. Um, Rod, since you started, uh, do you want to make some comment? Because you started, uh, yeah, as first, both the time. So I would like to give you briefly the floor if you have some comments after all the other have commented. I won't be long. Uh, I just, yeah, I just wanted to uh, respond to the very good uh, 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 comments that have been made uh, and questions raised, uh, for example, the issue of why me uh, and the issue of state cooperation. I think these are really important uh, questions. Um, I mean, on the, on the issue of state cooperation, um, um, the OTP is quite uh, open about this. The Office of the Prosecutor, uh, in its case selection and prioritization paper, it mentions that as one of the factors which, of course, will influence uh, whether you can roll out a case as a, as, as a prioritization factor is the degree of cooperation you might receive or the availability also of evidence. Obviously, these cases have to be built on, on evidence. Um, uh, it's a bit silly to say it, but, uh, and you have to have uh, opportunities to arrest people. The cases can't proceed, obviously, unless the person has first appeared. Uh, we don't have trials in absentia, although there are some who, who may uh, wish to see it. Uh, at this stage, uh, the case law doesn't allow for trials in absentia. But those are, so those are a lot of operational considerations, but they're not the only considerations. I think if it was, if it was an only an opportunity to the court, then uh, many of the warrants that have been issued by the court shouldn't exist uh, because they are not at all pragmatic or practical. Uh, there is no uh, feasibility in issuing an arrest warrant against uh, heads of states um, by the court. Uh, for example, in Sudan, uh, you know, um, against uh, head of state, minister of defense, uh, state minister in, in, in Darfur and so on. Um, or proceeding in investigations like Afghanistan where you're trying to investigate um, the Taliban, of course, but also the Afghan security forces, whose cooperation presumably you need to deploy, or the Taliban's whose cooperation you need to get to Taliban controlled area, where the Taliban sometimes control more of the territory than the state does, depending on the fluctuations, as well as accusing the, uh, the main outside partner who is involved, uh, the US Department of Defense and the CIA. Uh, so so if, you are, if you are a court driven by a cooperation, that's uh, a very uh, uh, bizarre approach to take uh, to open an investigation where you're targeting everybody who is, has a significant footprint on the situation. So I think in some of these situations, clearly cooperation is going to be a challenge and, and you have to deal with the, the reality that you either face a hostile operating environment because of the state being complicit in the crimes and unwilling to cooperate. The same in Bangladesh, Myanmar with the Myanmar regime and, and so on. Um, or the state is simply unable uh, because it doesn't control the territory uh, or is as itself collapsed, which also uh, represents uh, what we face often in, in Libya with the fluctuating situation on the ground um, um, and, and so on, and a number of other situations that we, we're dealing with. So I think uh, state cooperation, of course, is an important factor, but it's not, uh, not a sole factor. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, um, Indeed, we do have some cases involving rebels, but we've also had a, a, a number of cases involving government officials before the court. Um, not all of them are, uh, are succeeding equally. There may be an issue to critique about whether the court is able to deal effectively with um, suspects who are uh, before the court, who are government officials, who still have the apparatus of the state, where somehow th those cases seem to have more difficulty succeeding in court. 
sometimes there is uh, uh, allegations of witness interference or a hostile operating environment surrounding the collapse of those cases. In the Kenya cases, famously, of course, uh, the issue of witness interference uh, and insiders uh, um, all being interfered with, which resulted in Article 70 cases. That, that was quite a dominant aspect of those cases, uh, even if uh, the officer itself, of course, can be criticized for those cases, but that was a dominant theme. And, and in Cote d'Ivoire, equally, um, the, the extent to which the judges were able to be convinced by the evidence uh, put forward, and that's on appeal, so we'll see what the outcome of that is. Um, but I was just going to say on the issue of, um, so just to say, I think state cooperation is, is an important factor and it's acknowledged, but, but often um, the office may well end up investigating situations where there are no viable prospects for cooperation, but, but your credibility and leg legitimacy demands that the court uh, nonetheless endeavor and try to investigate because um, nobody will, will cooperate with you in these situations. And then just the last thing in terms of uh, why me, I think indeed this is a very valid question. And, and it's uh, again, one of these issues where I think internally within the office, we often struggle with, um, you know, the office is not a single person. It, it is the office of the prosecutor, but obviously there are a large number of colleagues who work within the office. Uh, it's a very, uh, under the current system, it's a very horizontal office. Uh, there are senior lawyers who are seasoned domestically. There are senior investigators or analysts. Uh, so, you know, each team has different suggestions and there's often a, a, a very, uh, open di discussion and, dis uh, and exchange uh, and uh, critical peer review over uh, the kind of cases that are put forward. And we operate in a very sort of horizontal format in terms of decision making. But often these questions of why me or why this particular suspect are often driven by opportunity and by evidence. So um, this is not a secret. Uh, the reason that uh, in the LRA investigation, uh, we have Coney and four commanders it's not that these were the only four commanders that Kony had, and these were his top commanders. There were other commanders of a similar rank, for example, to Ongwen or others. But in the, in the incidents that the office investigated, where there was good evidence and decided to focus on those particular IDP camps, these were the commanders who were principally involved in those particular attacks. If the office had investigated another incident through the better opportunity, it may have been another commander who have been, would have been there. So that is uh, a, an example of, of sheer opportunity, which is not very satisfying for the, for the suspect or for the victims. It's not satisfying at all for the victims of other incidents who also don't benefit from reparations. And as prosecutors, again, you always face this dilemma. Should we try to have a wider charge sheet to have more incidents, more representation, more victimization, so that more persons can benefit from the reparations scheme? But on the other side, you're trying to bring forward cases that are manageable, uh, that also can be efficiently prosecuted in court, which also reflects not only on judicial economy, but also fairness to the defendant. And you can't have these cases that ramble on for, for, for many years uh, with, with unmanageable scales. So there is already this tension at, at that stage. But also you have, and this is the last point I'm making, sometimes you have situations where a suspect uh, has been investigated for a particular conduct at a certain period of time, but has gone on to commit other crimes, sometimes equally horrific or sometimes even worse. And so you face the question as prosecutors, should you bring a, another indictment against the individual for later crimes? And this relates to uh, Roger's very good point about uh, Integanda, or we can say the same thing about Kony or Ongwen or others, uh, because those individuals uh, indeed, apart from the incidents for which they were charged, they went on to, uh, to uh, well, they're alleged to have committed other crimes. And uh, one of the questions that we face as prosecutors, when we get lots of uh, demand from victims and from stakeholders that we should also prosecute them for what's happened more recently, our response is typically also a very pragmatic one. Uh, our position has been that we have a good case against this individual, uh, which is, uh, if you like, representative of the kind of crimes he's committed, alleged to have been committed. This is the case that we want to invest in. If we do another case against the same person, this comes down to a very hard choice between doing a second case against Coney, for example, and not doing a case uh, uh, involving a suspect somewhere else. We have to make choices because of our limited capacity. So th these are very pra pragmatic considerations. They make sense for a prosecutor's office, but they don't make sense for the suspect or for the, or the victims who are looking at it. And then this, this uh, maybe I'll just finish with this catchphrase. This, this really goes, to, for me, I was just writing this down, this, this kind of dual roles that are sometimes projected on, 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 on international courts, which I think is, again, something that reflects comments to others. There are this twin expectation that uh, international prosecutors can be 
truth tellers that they are somehow they have this uh, almost uh, supernatural capacity to tell history because these cases resonate beyond the courtrooms to tell you know the entire narrative of a situation. So you, you expect the truth teller to tell the truth and to tell all aspects of the truth. But on the other hand, it's an office that's staffed with people who are investigators and prosecutors who are used to bringing criminal cases. And for them, that decision-making is driven by evidence, by opportunity, by arrests, by bringing cases, efficient cases, trying to prosecute them in court. It's a very mundane type of profile, which is very different from this notion of a truth teller. And I think perhaps these courts can't escape those labels. And of course, as a, as a prosecutor of an ICC, you have to be aware of your truth telling function. You can't run away from it and bury your head in the sand and say, I'm just bringing a case. You have to be aware of the resonance of your case. But also we should be aware that this is maybe one of these expectations, again, we project on these courts, uh, which has some legitimacy in that expectation, but it's also, we should be aware that it's, it's a little bit um, ambitious to expect these courts to be able to deliver on that truth teller function. So some humility, I think, uh, recognizing that humility on our side is very important, but also uh, a sense of, uh, of uh, modesty in terms of what these courts can achieve. Thank you, thank you very much, Rod. Uh, so we have we've seen the problem. We've seen that political bias is still perceived by the defense in particular. We talk about this why me question that continues to um, yeah to be there somehow, but also by the general public, as underlined by Rohir, for example. Um, Professor Clip has underlined that international crimes are inherently political but that probably more representation in the selection of, of cases is, is needed. Uh, we underline that it's difficult to have transparency, or here has suggested transparency at a later stage as a possible way out of this. Uh, Rod underlined that there are policy paper on selection and prioritization that shed some light on the criteria, that these are often related to opportunity, to the quality of evidence, to state cooperation, but also perceived legitimacy. We have seen that uh, um, these sometimes don't make sense for to defendants and to the general public who think Rod said that um, the prosecutor is a kind of truth teller. And then Shabas underlined on a control and supervision supervision mechanism that uh, uh, that would be against the independence of the of the prosecutor and that we need to embrace this discretion somehow as, as part of the job. If there are not um, more comments on on this, I would uh, turn to the final uh, talking point that uh, I've selected, which is uh, which looks of the future, which is ways forward. Um, the ICC will soon have uh, a new prosecutor, Karim Khan. So I, I would like to ask all of you, what are the lessons that you think the new prosecutor needs to have learned from the previous two prosecutors? Who wants to take the floor first? Not Rod this time. Do we want to start uh, maybe um, from uh, the defense this time and reverse the right of fair trial? I'll bite. <laughs> um, I think we're probably the last people to be telling necessarily the, the, the prosecution what to do, or maybe the first. It's one of the two. Um, I, I think obviously the new prosecutor coming in is well equipped um, in understanding the realities um, of, of what the Office of the Prosecutor will face. Um, but I think, uh, and this is from my perspective, one of the things um, maybe, we've talked about a lot of challenges here about the ability to have transparency. Um, sometimes you can't, as Rajir, I think, had said <laughs> several situations where you possibly can't and Rod as well. Um, but, but where you can, really utilizing those platforms that the prosecutor has, there's no shortage of platforms in particular um, to the media, to uh, on the ICC's own webpage, to the states themselves um, and with the UN Security uh, Council. No shortage of platforms to maybe go over some of the decisions that are made and, and some of the budgetary concerns that have been raised here. 
um, by some of the panelists, I think those need to be very clearly, clearly shown to the states um, and explained what it is that some of the choices are actually impacted by any budgetary constraint so that there is an understanding that this is what we can do with what we have. Um, and until that is, is fully communicated and understood both sides of it um, in a meaningful way, it does make some of those choices still quite restrictive and difficult um, from some of the things that we've heard here. Um, there's also this thought of, um, and I, I think several academics have talked about uh, maybe streamlining some of the, the policies of the prosecutor into the regulations of the prosecutor. I think in particular, um, Dapo Akande has mentioned that maybe the regulations of the prosecutor can integrate some of those later policy papers and some of those other provisions that are out there to make it easier for people to find what does guide the prosecutor's office um, without reading every single policy paper and report and, and uh, communique that comes out because there are quite a few. So maybe integrating those into the regulations of the prosecutor, which already exist and I don't think have been updated for quite some time, uh, unlike the regulations of the court or the regulations of the registry. That's just my first thought. Maybe that'll kick it off. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marie. Anyone who wants to jump in now? I feel a, bit, a little bit like the professor now, <laughs> questioning. <laughs> okay, um, William, I see you. Thank you. Well, okay. Um, I would tell Karim, first of all, my advice to him would be stop issuing policy papers. <laughs> um, I, I don't actually find them very helpful. Uh, when I look at them, they describe a policy, but I, I tell my students, why don't you look at what the prosecutor does and then work backwards to see if you can discern a policy in there. And it would be quite, I think it would be, we'd get a quite a different result. Um, I, I think that that's, I, I wouldn't spend too much time on policy papers. The other thing I tell them is don't be afraid of the United States. They threatened his predecessor. They threatened the staff on the OTP, and the Americans have proven now that they're a toothless tiger. They cannot stop the court. They cannot stop the prosecutor doing what, doing her job and doing what she has to do. Um, so I think that's a good lesson. It's a, it's a defeat for Donald Trump and for Pompeo. Uh, they tried. They thought that all they had to do was to, to, to shake a stick and everybody would bow down to them, and they haven't. So I think... I mean, I think that if Karim has any bank accounts in the United States, he should withdraw the money. But beyond that, I don't think he should be worried. Thank you very much. That's a very specific piece of advice. <laughs> Who wants to go next? I see Andre raising his hand, please. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, I think uh, uh, Bill's advice is already very good, uh, uh, but I think there are a couple of other uh, uh, issues. Uh, a, a, any prosecution will face uh, the situation that others will try to hijack uh, his or her agenda. Um, just follow your own uh, um, assessment, follow your own uh, uh, considerations. Uh, and don't uh, uh, allow others to, uh, to, to influence uh, uh, what on objective standards uh, uh, must be done. Uh, don't try to do everything. Um, lower expectations. I think this is one of the, 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 the major things. Uh, I think uh, Rod mentioned that a couple of times that the expectations are sky high of what the OTP or the tribunal can achieve. Uh, it is much, much, much lower. And, and in that sense, of course, uh, um, defense arguments of, uh, of bad luck that you find yourself uh, in, in the Hague as an accused, that, that is valuable uh, because they simply cannot do everything. Choose your battles, um, try to stimulate the, the importance of complementarity. I think we have lost sight of the importance of complementarity. Uh, it was one of the basic foundations that, that states would do most of the work and the uh, ICC would uh, do the more difficult cases or the cases that that's simply cannot be done by, by states because they relate to holders of an immunity. Uh, and last but not least, uh, 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 do well what you do. 
uh, so the choices you make, uh, uh, do them as, as, as good as possible. Uh, because that is, I think, the way to, to show that, uh, uh, that uh, um, the tribunal, that the ICC is, uh, is effective. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andre, for these other great pieces of advice, I would say. Uh, I see another hand here. Marie-Hélène, please go ahead. Sorry, Roger, I've just seen you. You can go after Marie-Hélène. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, uh, I, I'll go in, in, in the direction that Marie went earlier, right? So Kareem Khan obviously is well known in, in defense circles as being an amazing defense lawyer. And to be frank, I would have preferred him staying on my side rather than going on the other. Uh, but it is what it is. And, and it'll be interesting to see if, um, if he will, because he's, he's well aware of all the criticism from a defense perspective and everything that me and Marie have said earlier. Um, he knows all this. Now, it'll be interesting to see what his mindset is when he goes on the other side and whether he will actually try to rectify some of the wrongs that Marie and I have discussed, or if on the other hand, he, or contrary, he, he will, um, you know, really fit in the, the, the current mindset of the office of the prosecutor. And of course, one aspect is what, what he will do with these high profile investigations, Palestine, Afghanistan. And that's interesting, don't get me wrong, but what interests me more is how he will deal with, with the real cases, with what's happening in the courtroom in individual, individual cases. Will, he, um, will we see a change in, in, the, in the culture in terms of prosecution? Will we see that maybe there is more transparency in the disclosure process? Will we see that there is more fairness in the way that uh, accused are referred to? It, it, will we see a difference in the way that they are um, uh, having relationship with, with defense counsel. Um, those things interest me a lot more, frankly. Uh, they'll have a, a, a real impact in practice on the ground uh, in, in the day-to-day -day practice of the ICC. Um, so we'll see. I, I certainly hope that there's gonna be more collegiality, uh, but you know, we'll see what happens. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria Lynn. That's an interesting uh, perspective, of course. Uh, Rohir, please um, go ahead. Um, thanks. Uh, yeah, I'll focus, uh, like Marie-Lan, a bit on well the the specific um, aspects of of the the, the the trial, kind of running a trial, the court. Um, but I'll combine it with my academic um, specialization and my hobby horse, international humanitarian law. Um, I think one thing that because I, I, I don't want to say anything in relation to case or, or situation selection of what to do with all these difficult situations. I don't um, don't envy uh, Kareem in that sense. Uh, but I think what would be really good for the office of the prosecutor to manage to somehow be um, transform itself in a way that it can be seen as like a magistrate's office, like in in countries like. Germany, uh, the Netherlands, some of the civil law prosecutions are magistrates. It's very normal to ask for an acquittal when you're up there in trial and you, it's very normal to withdraw a case. There's no, and, and not to be uh, less to be seen as a party. And that relates a bit to some of the points Maria Land made. Um, and so there's no need to hold on to a case to the bitter end, not for resources and not for um, I, just for the, the, the way of how um, um, uh, the fairness of the institution is seen. And as then a more practical advice, um, but that, that plays down to a lot of things like to be seen as such is it, it will relate to specific choice, but also choices during trials um, and choices in terms of charging, I think. And in that sense, I, um, as, a, as a practical advice, and Kareem is not, uh, not listening on, I assume, but there are some uh, members of the Office of the Prosecutor, and, and Rod is, uh, although I know he disagrees with me on some of these points, um, to, to charge maybe more broadly, but just take really good care in terms of the charging. So it's not necessary afterwards to try to, to save a charge at a matter of all costs, which can lead to massive legal debates that are 
either unnecessary if you just had gone for another charge. So then Bill wrote uh, an, an article in relation to that on Almighty, like he was first, he, I think he said, pled guilty to, but then after the convictions that was convicted of a trial uh, of a crime he didn't um, commit. There's now an issue before the appeals chamber. So I won't go into the, um, to the legal question, but it's the fact that like, like a tiny kind of matter that related to a, a way of having charged something leads to an enormous legal debate that takes up resources and that, at least from my perception, will lead to, um, um, uh, will damage the integrity of an important body of law for the court of international humanitarian law um, is unfortunate. And, and that comes, that relates more to this bigger issue like uh, Sometimes it's it's also okay to be uh, to take your losses or to be seen to to uh, not no longer support a witness if the witness is just not credible, or to to let go of certain charges. Say like, well, yeah, we we haven't proven these particular charges, so we actually ask for an acquittal for this part of the um, of the um, of the document containing the charges. And I think that trying to transform the office in such a way to become less party like and to get a less like um, party-like trial um, may be uh, a good thing in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rod here. Uh, Rod, do you, have, do you want the floor? Do you want to? Sure, I, I, not very much to say. I mean, I think uh, obviously Karim will have to take on in particular the, the, this discussion we had earlier about the mismatch between um, demand and, and, and resources. Uh, uh, you might remember when when uh, when the current prosecutor had to first assumed office. Uh, one of the things she said is that uh, I'm going to correct uh, some things that we did wrong uh, uh, under the prom prosecutor. I'm going to narrow the number of things I do. I'm going to do them in more depth. I'm going to do in-depth investigations. I'm only going to do a few cases. It's going to take more time, but at least I'm going to prioritize quality rather than quantity. Um, but towards the end of our term, we realize we we are again pulled back into the issue of overstretch. And it's, it's, it's not that the prosecutor forget, forgot uh, what she committed to, it's just that this is also uh, in some ways an inevitable tension. And, and within the office, we always have this debate about uh, also, uh, are we stretch too thin, uh, we need to focus on, on quality, obviously, and, and obviously all your credibility relies, relies on the strength of your cases in court. But also I just want to say that of course, these are difficult cases. If they were not difficult, the ICC should not be investigating them. If they were, uh, foot soldiers with their hands on the trigger, then these would, we would say that these are not um, the kind of cases we would expect the ICC to, to deal with. So sometimes uh, cases that go wrong in court also um, are as a result of evidence not playing out the way that you had expected it. Maybe insiders uh, don't uh, uh, um, deliver the testimony in the manner that you had uh, taken the, the statement beforehand or the uh, crime-based witness uh, doesn't um, uh, testify in the, in the, in, on all the details that you would expect, or they do, and the judges, uh, uh, or some of the judges, are not willing to accept your case theory. And, I, and this is the point I just wanted to introduce, which I think we, we're missing, of course, is that case selection is also very much shaped by judicial decisions. And um, as we know, in the practice of these courts, there is a high level of uh, uh, it is synchronicity in, in decision making. Judges, of course, are independent and they're very different from each other and they, they assess evidence very differently. You see this uh, obviously uh, emblematically in the Bember Appeals Judgment where the judges were, were very critical of each other in terms of how each of them assessed evidence and how they applied the relevant appellate standard and all the rest. So uh, very often um, the result of cases can be driven as much by um, who are the judges that you face as much as the quality of the evidence, or this can happen. Of course, this happens at the domestic level. Uh, cases all the time are, are, are subject to uh, the judge that you appear before. But I think, again, it's, it's a, the element of concentration, the fact that you only have a few cases before the ITC. Uh, you may, at some points, only have one judgment that comes out that whole year, uh, if, if at all. And, and uh, so all of these issues get concentrated. And of course, if, if judicial decision-making is tending towards expecting uh, much more connectivity between the evidence, not willing to draw inferences, not willing to accept uh, 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 um, common plans in the way that the prosecutor uh, tries to infer it, because there is no smoking gun in these cases. If, the judges, uh, if some of the judges want uh, the evidence to be laid out in, a, in, a, in an almost uh, atomized form in a mechanical fashion, 
then that's going to drive the prosecutor to bring forward uh, simpler cases against lower level perpetrators where he or she can be assured of success and avoiding those tricky cases that require uh, a, a more uh, uh, inference based uh, determination to go off the group leadership, the, the prosecutor will stay away from those cases because uh, it's clear that the judges are not willing to, to draw those kinds of inferences or they don't feel comfortable with that, that kind of evidence. Um, or we also don't have the tools. We don't have joint criminal responsibility uh, three. We don't have JCE three. So we'll see, we also don't have the, the tools that perhaps at the national level for organized crime or for you know, some of these uh, conspiracy type cases that have been developed to deal with group criminality, the ICC is going in the opposite direction. It's rejecting these conspiracy type uh, um, tools for good or for bad, but the result will be again, driving how prosecutorial discretion fits. So I think it's also interesting to examine as part of this discussion, not just obviously the prosecutor is a key component of course, but also how much judicial decision-making can drive prosecutorial decision-making on charges and, and suspects and so on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rod. Um, if no one has anything to add, we have already some questions from the audience. So um, I would turn to them if you all agree, of course, if you have anything else to add. We have a few interesting ones coming through. Um, the last one, for example, we received is um, in the early days of the ICC, we saw a more dominant role of the OTP reliance on intermediaries such as local civil society for collection of evidence, witness protection, etc., and even the court's invitation to begin investigation, such in the Kenyan case. I hardly heard discuss and talks about the role of these intermediaries in prosecutorial discretion. Is it because of their um, receding role in the Rome system of justice now that the court has affirmed its position and grow or anything else? So to summarize uh, how the role of intermediaries is important or not in the, in the discretion that the OTP has. Anyone has some comments on this, can answer on this? Probably Rod is more suited, but feel Rod, free. I'll be very brief. I mean, I think, I mean, I think indeed the role of intermediaries was obviously a, a key aspect of the Lubanga judgment because of, I think not so much the role, uh, so the use of intermediaries. Intermediaries are used all the time by the court across the board in different aspects, but also at the national level. But it was uh, what functions they performed and the concern uh, of the trial chamber that um, the intermediaries went beyond what was uh, the appropriate role and may have been involved in in perhaps uh, um, um, shaping the way in which the evidence was heard. Uh, and that featured in, in the way that they discounted um, ev evidence that they, they had concerns about. Uh, since then, obviously, um, the court has, a, uh, has examined its use of intermediaries, not just the OTP, but registry and so on. And it's adopted guidelines, the OTP has its own guidelines. I think this issue has become less apparent uh, in the subsequent cases, uh, um, certainly the current cases that are before the court. In the Kenya context, it, it, it rose to some extent in relation to, uh, again, some of the witnesses that came forward. But I think in Kenya, they, uh, it wasn't the same type of uh, 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 issue as it, as it features in Labanga. So I think to some extent, um, I mean, my own view is it's, it's, it's more of a historical feature of the early case or cases. Uh, and, uh, and it also varies. In some situations, uh, there is much less need for intermediaries, but the role of intermediaries is typically just to um, help the interlocutor, whether it's defense, will also have intermediaries or a registry or, or the OTP to, to uh, um, identify some opportunities and to facilitate some, some initial um, 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 uh, directions, uh, uh, efforts in terms of trying to identify a, 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 um, relevant opportunities, but then the office obviously takes over and, and limits the, the, the involvement of, of those third parties in its work. But also increasingly you have uh, others who are involved in the collection of evidence, uh, where, whether it's national law enforcement or uh, locally recruited persons. So the office has to, um, to some extent, rely on a broader um, um, array of actors, but it must take responsibility, obviously, for ultimately what is presented in court. And must, it must be clear that that has not been uh, in, in any way altered or, or, or tampered with. Thank you very much, Rod. Do the others have anything to add on this? Or 
Yes, Marie-Hélène, please. Just, just, just briefly, yeah, very briefly. Um, it is indeed uh, not as prevalent in, in recent cases, at least the ones that I've been involved into, and that's a good thing. Um, the problem with intermediaries is um, you have to wonder, I mean, a, a lot of people out there have a personal um, interest in the outcome of the cases. Now, for intermediaries, you have to wonder what is their specific interest and, and what are they willing to, to do to achieve uh, those personal objectives that they may have. And so that's why I think uh, the most important thing and what might have been lacking early, or, you know, earlier on was the proper vetting of these intermediaries. You need to know who you're working for, uh, who you're working with, what are their objectives, uh, you know, and, and what are their methods. Um, so anyway, it's, it's a tricky, I think it's a tricky thing to do um, in, a, in a situation country where you might not have a, a strong presence. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's a welcome development that they're relying less on, on such individuals. Thank you very much. Anyone wants to jump in or shall we proceed with another question? Okay, another question I will say. Uh, so we have uh, another question. I think we touched upon this already a little bit. Um, uh, they ask, I would be curious about the so-called high risk situations. What do panelists think about high stake political cases such as Ukraine and Georgia that will require at least some cooperation of Russia? Is it worth to spend the discretion capital on pursuing this situation or is it preferable to focus on more manageable situations? Anything to say on this? I think we, we touched upon a little bit because Rod underlined already um, uh, the, the importance of having cases that are somehow man manageable and also like evidence are, yeah, available. Uh, I see William wants to say something on this. I think it's very important that the court take on the high risk situations. I don't know if it can do all of them. Uh, again, these are, are matters where there are so many variables. We can't be you know, directive or prescriptive about what the prosecutor should do. But the idea that the prosecutor should back off on so-called high risk situations or very difficult situations, it's a bit like having a local prosecutor who says, you know, we're going to concentrate on the shoplifters because the mafia dons are just too big for us to deal with. It's not a credible system if you do that, I think, and it would be it will be unacceptable to, to global civil society. Uh, it's very important that the, that the court uh, demonstrate that it's willing and able to take on some hard cases, as well as to to master the easy ones. Thank you. Yeah. And maybe I was just, add, I mean, I think just to echo, I mean, many of the situations now before the court, they're all, if you like, in this high risk or, or a difficult situation. I mean, if the, Ukraine and Georgia have been mentioned, Bangladesh, Myanmar is the same, Afghanistan, Palestine, if you look at Prince Nations, Venezuela, Philippines, I mean, they're all high, high risk. Um, so, and, but also looking at which, which are the easier situations, none of them are particularly easy. They're also difficult. Uh, you know, it may be that you have a cooperative authorities, but the authorities themselves are in the middle of a conflict zone or they don't have access over the territory. So also, um, you know, operating in Central African Republic is a, is a huge high risk because the authorities have very limited control outside of Bangui. Um, and we have suspects on both sides of the, of the political divide, some of them part of the current government who, who are, uh, you know, um, the focus of ICC investigations. And also you have lots of under seal warrants or in Mali where you have, uh, you know, hard, large parts of the territory also under the control of, of uh, radical groups. Uh, so uh, terrorist organizations. So I think that, that's the reality of the court's work. There are very few easy situations. So you can't walk away from high risk. But of course, the court also has to just practically manage the situation that it also needs to have um, a balance between cases that can result in um, persons being arrested and prosecuted, um, as well as uh, those cases where arrest may not be on the horizon, but nonetheless, those cases demand uh, an investigation and prosecution. You cannot just walk away from cases because there isn't an opportunity to arrest and surrender somebody. So you need to have some kind of balance between those, those objectives properly. Thank you very much, Rod. Anyone? Uh, yeah, I see Rod here. Raise his hand, please. Um, thank you. Uh, yeah, I, well, Rod has now addressed some of it. What I think um, 
is uh, with those difficult cases is important to realize that also the normal cases aren't necessarily that easy. Uh, the, the issue of intermediaries just came up, but that was in the first cases, one of the things, even though um, the DRC was cooperating, the area where the alleged crimes took place was at the time not under government control and was under control of, uh, for example, the Katanga and Gujulo case, there, the, um, there was a site visit where the, um, where the area where the crimes would have taken, uh, uh, allegedly took place, uh, was under control of, um, of a group um, that was more friendly to the, uh, to the accused, so to the defense, uh, as opposed to the prosecution. And in relation to that, the, when there was a site visit, David Hooper, the counsel for uh, Mr. Ketanga made the interesting comment that that must be the first case in history where a uh, criminal case in history where the, def uh, where the judges beat the prosecution to the crime site because they were allowed to go first and then only the parties came. Um, so, and that, and that was in a situation where you had a cooperating government. Um, in relation to all these difficult situations, and there are many now, of course, I think it's very important to stress that this was a question now from the public that the public may for a very long time not be aware of what's really going on in those cases because if you don't have um if, if you have a hostile uh, government um you're not you're unlikely to make uh, arrest warrants uh, uh public so and investigations have to be done not not fully in the open, um, not in the same way as how you would, uh, you, you can't, so you can't show your cards as the officer of the prosecutor. So even if things may not happen for um, many years, or it may appear not to happen, may not mean that nothing is happening. Um, because yeah, especially in those cases, you, you can't just uh, uh, go around and, um, and, and telling who you would, uh, who would like to have arrested, um, because then you'll never um, get those persons before the court. Thank you very much, Rohir. Anyone else wants to say something? Andre, please go ahead. I think the, the very fact that, uh, that a, a, a major world power like Russia or the United States is very much upset about uh, investigations that are going on uh, is evidence of the fact that the, the OTP is investigating in the right cases uh, and that, that uh, uh, the effects are there uh, the same goes for the African uh, uh, cases in which uh, uh, African states are, are very much upset about uh, uh, investigations. Uh, that is exactly where, what one of the reasons that the ICC was established uh, uh, to, to bring an end uh, uh, to a situation that those that have the power can do as they please. Uh, and that power has come to an end. And of course, I can imagine that, that uh, those that are, are, are used to have the power and to, to do as they please are unhappy with it. Uh, but I think that the, 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 the OTP should uh, uh, be encouraged uh, to go on that road and uh, uh, to follow the path and uh, conduct further investigations exactly in those, uh, uh, those uh, highly politicized and high risk situations. Yes. Thank you very much. Anyone wants to add something on this? I don't think so. Okay, uh, so another question we received is how to deal with non-genuine cooperation from states to prevent the prosecutor office, the OTP, from opening an investigation. I'm thinking uh, they had here about the Venezuelan case. Anyone wants to reply on this, Rod? Yeah, I mean, just to say that on Venezuela, I mean, we've we've stated that we we we're planning to uh, make a decision on whether to open investigation or, or not uh, before the prosecutor leaves. So um, this is something we said in December last year. So you'll see our results uh, soon on that. Um, the genuineness test is 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 a difficult one, obviously, to establish because you need to be able to prove that the authorities are not genuine. So far, the case law of the court has managed to largely sidestep this issue because it's been just the first issue of, are they doing even this case? Because uh, if they're not doing this case, there's no conflict. And therefore, it's more a question of uh, uh, the ICC doing some cases and states doing another. 
I know this has been heavily criticized in the literature, but this is a, quite a normal situation for the court to take to say that uh, before we get into the issue of whether there's a conflict between what the state wants to do, and what the ICC wants to do, we should examine whether or not this uh, involves the same subject matter. But the issue of genuineness, where it is the same case, but then the office of the prosecutor might suggest, well, the state may be doing the same case that we're doing or substantially the same case, it's comparable, um, but that the state is, is somehow un, un, unwilling or unable, it's not genuinely investigating. There, uh, it's, it's, it's a much more difficult uh, test for the court to be able to uh, uh, establish. Um, the, the, the office obviously needs to have evidence that can rebut the arguments of the state or the defendant, if the defendant brings the challenge that they have themselves already been subject to in this case prosecution. And I think the obviously the, the case law of the court will increasingly go in that direction. You see that the office also had a very difficult time um, making sense of um, the situation in Iraq, UK, where uh, there were many indicators of issues, of problems with the way the national process had been conducted. But the office also uh, didn't have uh, evidence that it could substantiate to, to argue that it was uh, the, the cases were done to shield, knowing that it would have to be able to um, rebut evidence that the UK authorities would bring. And instead it issued a very detailed report where it just openly um, set out its findings, which I think it's, you know, it's right for criticism, of course, and for examination, but it, it's an example of how difficult the genuineness test can be um, uh, in those situations. But I think for Venezuela, as I said, uh, the office is committed to an outcome uh, in the next uh, few months, so, so you'll, you'll see the results, I, I guess, in due course. Thank you very much, Rod. Anyone wants to add anything on this? Next question. Um, my question is about the pace of the prosecutor office in opening investigation. This is really like a mantra kind of question. So particularly why it took so many years to decide on investigating the situation in Palestine. And I, I would add to this question, maybe what are the problems that are that are linked with the with these paces that are yeah long paces. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer in in pre examinations trying to be more efficient and 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 and, and quicker. One of the things we've tried to do, I mean, this is just uh, pragmatically, we've increased the number of people who are involved in pre-examination by involving prosecutors and investigators much earlier in the process, because before it was a very small unit dealing with it by itself, and obviously can only manage to prioritize uh, uh, its work in, in that, in, in a, you know, with those small means. But these days, uh, a large number of people are involved on pre-examinations. Uh, but also on Palestine, uh, as you saw, the main issue that, um, if you like, uh, took up the timing was on the issue of making a discretionary decision, uh, India has discussed, to seek a ruling. Um, another prosecutor might have decided differently, might have decided not to open an investigation or might have decided to open an investigation without seeking a ruling and then to hope for the best and just to deal with this issue down the line. Uh, this office uh, with the current prosecutor took the decision to preempt some of these legal challenges because it's, it feel like one of the core issues that will come up. And this also arose because the office engaged with both the Israeli and Palestinian authorities, amongst others, and uh, it was quite a robust exchange. And one of the issues that came up in the arguments was that this preconditional issue has to be resolved, surely. And I, and I think the office took that on board, that indeed it recognized that this precondition issue did need to be resolved. It recognized that there were uh, valid arguments uh, that, that needed to be uh, heard. This was something that was inevitably going to arise in litigation and better to resolve it now and then have a process that allows the chamber to hear from all views uh, and, uh, and to try to resolve it. Um, we have a decision now and on that. It provides some clarity if some things have been left open as you saw in the decisions. Um, so there is still scope for litigation. Uh, so it's not a complete resolution of all the issues, but at least the prosecutor now has the ability to proceed uh, uh, on, on, a, on a judicially tested footing, as opposed to people criticizing a decision that hasn't had judicial review. And I think for many years, the question has always been the prosecutor's discretion doesn't have judicial review. I think increasingly in recent years, it's it, uh, the prosecutor sought judicial guidance on some of these issues, in fact, to make her own life uh, uh, more, um, more easier and, and more efficient, if you like. Uh, but that, that's one of the reasons uh, of the, the time it took for, for, uh, for that decision. Thank you very much, Rod. I see that Marie-Hélène wants to add something. Please go ahead. 
Yes, well, of course, I don't have any uh, insider information about what went on, and I can only imagine the, the how heated those discussions must have been in, in the office of the prosecutor. Um, it, it's it's a situation where basically it's dumb if you do, dumb if you don't. There's it, there's going to be fallback, no matter what you decide. And I think it was interesting that they requested uh, judicial authorization. Um, I saw it as a, a type of a, basically an attempt to shift the responsibility back onto the judges rather than take it uh, entirely on, on their own shoulders. Maybe I'm wrong there. Uh, but I, I find it interesting that the, this, um, the decision was pending for a really, really long time. And I don't think it is entirely um, coincidental that it only came out after the change of administration in Washington. And so that's how you see the interplay between judicial decisions and and uh, and political uh, events around the world thank you very much anyone wants to add something on this question doesn't seem so so i think we have just time for maybe a very last one um so do the panelists have any thoughts on how we can better improve the relationship between the ICC prosecutor and the UN Security Council, particularly in regards to budgetary concerns? Please, William, go ahead. Well, I've always thought from the very beginning of the Security Council referrals that the prosecutor should have refused to proceed on them because of the conditions that the Security Council attached to them. And as people know, the, in the two cases where the Security Council has referred situations, there has been a, a, both a refusal to uh, provide funding for, the, uh, for the, the work of the prosecutor and of the court, contrary to what is set out in the Rome Statute. And secondly, a very, very uh, unacceptable attempt to provide a kind of immunity for prosecution to, um, to certain individuals. So I think the prosecutor should have looked at that and said, that's not a referral that's consistent with Article 13B of the statute. And so I'm not going to do anything on it. So uh, they haven't done that. I remember in, in 2005, when the, when the first resolution was adopted, there was a sense among many people in the court uh, along the lines of, let's hold our noses. It's unpleasant, but this is so important to us to get the Security Council referral. We've seen that the Security Council referrals have not really done a great deal for the work of the court over the years. Um, in the case of the Bashir case, they've had it running around in circles only to get a final ruling on his immunity after he's been thrown out of power when the question becomes irrelevant. So I think we could have done without them. So it's never too late to fix it. I think the prosecutor would improve the relationship with the Security Council if she said, or he said, I have a statute. The statute says you've got to fund the, the, the referrals. And the statute also says that you can't, or at least the statute as I understand it, doesn't allow you to carve out exceptions when you make a referral. So I'd be very happy to work with you and cooperate with you, but you'll have to respect the statute. I think that would improve the relationship. Thank you. Thank you very much. If there's nothing to add on this, I would uh, like to ask the panelists if they have, uh, you know, some final thoughts to share with our audience because we are unfortunately at the end of the event. So just a very brief round if anyone wants to add anything. It seems and, and Andrea was speaking, no? Okay. <laughs> Okay, well, then, uh, um, thank you very much for, for the discussion. I think it was extremely interesting. Um, of course, thank you very much to all the panelists that made this possible, that were extremely uh, willing to, to join us. Um, I would like to thank you also my technical support here um, that also helped with the live tweeting. Um, I would like to uh, thank you very much the Loven Center for Global Governance Studies, of course, that hosted us and um, also the, the entire audience because we had many participants and I'm, I'm very happy um, also of the, the discussion and the question that came up. Um, Thank you again. Uh, we recorded, so the recording will be uh, available um, by email for who registered. And well, I have nothing else to add. 
So thank you very much again. Thank you, Deletta, for organizing it. Thank you. Thanks. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone.